introduce our guest speaker today is to give a glimpse of how God has used him in my life and that of others in our church. His education, his church ministry, his teaching, his professional ministry, which of course you could read up at the Westminster Theological Seminary website. All of this reflect how Pastor Van Dixon has spent a lifetime of studying deeply, reflecting, writing, teaching, and preaching what is of utmost importance to our life in our following Jesus. God has used him mightily in deepening my faith as I sat through his um, Sunday school classes and sat through his pulpit preaching at my OPC church in Vienna, Virginia. But most of all, knowing him and his wife, Emily, she is my Bible study leader, and their five children up close has been a refreshing taste of a family so normal, so typical, and yet so clearly inspiring in their passion to welcome any and every person, friends and strangers alike, to their meals, to their home, their life, just because they love Jesus. Let's praise God for his servant, Pastor yes. Van Dixhorn's opening the word to us. Thank you, dear sister, for those kind comments. Can, can you hear me? Can you hear me clearly? Can you hear me well? Ra raise a thumb if you can hear me well. Yes, yes. Okay, um, because I could also put on headphones if that would be better. Well, um, I, I'm just so grateful to speak with you today. I'm thankful for the kind words of my friend Nanny uh, and for the, for the wonderful uh, songs of praise on just the right theme. Uh, praise, praise God for this opportunity to be together. Let me encourage you uh, this morning or this evening uh, to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13. We'll be reading verses 5 to 9. But let me quickly set the scene for you uh, before we read those verses. The writer of this inspired letter uh, began by speaking of the past, uh, the yesterday of long ago when God spoke by the prophets. And then he, then he turned to what God is doing today, these last days when he has spoken to us by his son, the son who was and still is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. The, the one who upholds the universe by the word of his power, but who is also the one who has finally offered us rest, that the great high priest who has ascended into heaven and who offered his own blood. And, and then because God loves us, we're also given the final chapters in Hebrews, chapters of, of tomorrow. Uh, chapter 11 makes uh, Old Testament saints, our teachers, as we see what they did by faith. And then chapter 12 tells us to look ahead in our own race that we are running to the same Jesus, the, the founder and perfecter of our faith, and not to grow weary as we march towards Mount Zion and the heavenly Jerusalem. It's in the rich soil of these chapters about Jesus that the writer roots this chapter of commands for Christ's church. This is, this is the grammar of the gospel. First, the, the, the indicatives or the command or, or, or the facts about God uh, and what he has done. And then the imperatives, the, the commands for God's people. Now, as you read with me in just a moment, notice how, even in the midst of these commands, that the writer cannot resist telling us twice, in fact, even more about our faithful, unchanging God. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the spirit of the writer of this letter was in all of us? How, how rich our ministries and our prayers would be if we were not only committed to hard, life-changing, and challenging conversations, but if we also had this writer's 
irresistible urge to point people to God in all that we say and all that we do. Now, that was a long introduction for us for a short meditation, a kind of a large porch for a small house. So thank you for, for bearing with me with this uh, brief word of exhortation. Let us now read some lines from Hebrews 13, beginning at verse 5. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, help us by your spirit. Fulfill your design. Help us to see Jesus in these words to see him in every line. And we ask all this in his name. Amen. There are so many ways to keep on loving brothers and sisters in Christ. And chapter 13 gives us a few important examples. If you, if you cast your eye up to, to the opening verses of the chapter, you'll see them. One way is to show hospitality, not inviting people into your home because you enjoy it, but because they need it. Another way of loving the brothers is to remember those who suffer in prison, praying for them, maybe visiting with them if we can. Yet another way we can do this is to, is to honor the marriages of others, praying that, that other couples will flourish and not dreaming about people who are already spoken for. Still yet another way to love the brothers is to keep our lives free from the love of money, to not want what they have, but to be content with what we have. Now we, can, now we all know that, that both poor people and rich people can love money. We do not need to have it already in order to want it more than we should. But how do we keep our lives free from the love of money. There are two steps to stop loving money and to use our energies to love others instead. What one step is to stop wanting all the things that money buys. The other step is to stop looking for the security that money can offer. For, for people with enough money always seem to get what they want. And so we want more of it to feel safer. Billionaires tend to have fewer fears than people who live in slums. We want money because of greed and we want money to answer our fear. But the real answer to greed, as our passage tells us, is to be content with what we have. And the answer to fear is to be confident of help when we need it. Now, there are, there are little tricks to fight greed. You can throw out the magazines that come in the door unless you really need something in it. Uh, you, you can speed your way through commercials on television. You can spend less time at the shopping center. These are useful, but they are only techniques. They don't reach the bottom of the problem. They only deal with the surface. The, the fact is that a lack of contentment really shows up in all kinds of ways. And, and not just the love of money, but a love of other people's marriages, as in verse 4. Or a lack of love for people who suffer, in verse 3. Or not enough care for those who are in need, as we see in verse 2. If we're, if we're going to stop hoping for contentment in this world, we will have to 
We have to be hunting for contentment beyond this world. We, we need something better than what money can buy or this world can give. And that is why we have the contentment giving promise at the end of verse 5. And it's reminder of the one who is with us. There are also little tricks to fight fear. Self-help, te- self-help uh, uh, techniques like focusing on the positive or, uh, or, or breathing exercises or, or fresh air or, or, or outdoor exercise. Or if you have the money, you, and, and, and you can have a diversified portfolio or an anxiety coach. But if we're going to live life free of a love of money, we will discover that each one of these techniques only offers confidence for a little while. And then all the fears begin to come back. And that is why we have that confidence, we have those confidence-inspiring quotations in verse 6. And the reminder of the one who is for us. In other words, in, in the first half of our passage, the writer to the Hebrews interrupts his commands because the only way we can do what he has asked is is for us to be pointed to God himself. If your master is money, you will never be content. You'll live a life where, where greed and fear reign over you. If your master is God, and you can only serve one of the other, as Jesus said, you will find contentment and confidence. Now, now a lot of writing by Christians has focused on the the amazing force of the negatives in the Greek of verse 5. And I love that. As As a glorious old hymn puts it, that soul that on Jesus has leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That that soul that all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Those, Those negative statements are powerful and comforting and strong. But I want you to see today that the main point of verse five and verse six is, is that, is, that uh, is, is, is not found in the not forsaking. Uh, the, the, the main point, it's close, it's close. But the main point, and if you think about it, you'll see this. The main point is that our hope actually lies in the one who speaks these promises. The main point is that God is the one who says, I will never leave you. The main point is that the Lord is our helper. The answer to all our greed and our fear, the the, the great fact that gives us the contentment of verse 5 and the confidence of verse 6 is the complete sufficiency of God. Just pause for a minute. And consider with me why that is. It's because of who God is. Consider the God who spoke dinosaurs into existence. Who thought a plan of salvation into reality. Consider the God of the rainbow and the Red Sea and the water from the rock. The God of Jericho's falling walls, Elijah's fire from heaven, Manasseh repentance, Daniel's lion's den, and Nehemiah's answered prayer. He is yours, never to forsake you. He will help you. So you should never fear anything, least of all what man can do. Do you see that? Charles Spurgeon once asked and answered all the right questions about this passage. He says this, What is guaranteed in this promise? Beloved, herein does God give his people everything. I 
will never leave you. Then no attribute of God can cease to be engaged for us. Is he mighty? He will show himself strong on behalf of them that trust him. Is he love? Then with everlasting loving kindness, he will have mercy upon us. Whatever attributes may compose the character of deity, every one of them, to its fullest extent, shall be engaged on our side. Moreover, whatsoever God has, Spurgeon went on to say, whether it be in the lowest Hades or in the highest heavens, whatever can be contained in infinity or can be held within the circumference of eternity, whatever in the end can be in him who fills all things and yet is greater than all things shall be with his people forever. Since he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is why we are to be content and confident because this God is our God. Do you know what's the best thing that's happened to me all week? You can probably guess by now. The best thing that's happened to me all week is that the organizers of this conference asked me to speak about these verses, five and six. For in these verses, the, the Holy Spirit takes us by the hand and, and he shows us once more the astonishing privilege that such a God is with us and for us. Actually, that's not quite true. This blessing is tied with another blessing this week. Two blessings. The other blessing is that you asked me also to study with you verses 7 to 9. Verse 8 is probably the best known verse in Hebrews and maybe my favorite. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, just think about that. How different Jesus is from you and me. For us, it would be the worst news. It would be a disaster if we were the same. Yesterday, I was impatient. I don't want to be today what I was yesterday. This morning, I was hurried in my prayers and too cool in my affection toward God. I don't want to be tomorrow what I am today. My hope, your hope, is that we have been, are being, and will be changed. Change is the dream for the Christian. Change is our hope. Sameness is our nightmare. And for a non-Christian, it is his or her doom. But you see how different it is for Jesus, for the Son of God, mysteriously, even for the Son of God incarnate. It is his glory not to change. This is, this is one of his perfections, that he's an unchanging God. What good would it be if God needed to change in order to relate to us or to save us or, or for any reason at all? What good would it be if the God who promised never to forsake us and always to help us was a changeable God? Frail as summer's flower, we flourish, blows the wind, and it is gone. But while mortals rise and perish, God endures and changing on. Or as another modern hymn says, Behold, there the risen Lamb my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am. That's our hope. And not only does God remain the same, but his truth remains the same. His grace, his love remain unchanged and unchanging. It's, it's this hope, really, that underlies our most cherished truths, as we can see in our most precious hymns, old and new. O word of God incarnate, O oh, wisdom from on high, O oh, truth unchanged, unchanging, O oh, light of our dark sky, 
Encouraged by the letter to the Hebrews, we sing, When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Do you see that? Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it. Mount of God's unchanging love. Praise God that Jesus was and is and will be the same. But uh, I confess that for a while, as much as I love that truth, the more I studied verse 8 and its place in this chapter this week, the more puzzled I became. My, my problem was, that I could not figure out how it connected to the verse before or to the verse after. I was speaking with a friend this week about this problem, and he commented that this verse is a little bit like Melchizedek. It seems to come out of nowhere without any kind of obvious father or mother. It's, it seems to be inserted without a proper beginning or end. But, but I think I see it now, and I'd like to share that with you tonight or this morning. Look with me at verse 7. The, the writer returns once more to exhortations. Having, having been called to love their brothers, they're now called to remember their leaders. The leaders are teachers. They're people who have spoken the word of God. And their message must be remembered. Their way of life must be considered. And their faith must be copied. But what did the leaders speak from the word of God? What, what was the truth that shaped their life? What's the content of the faith that these leaders confess and which Christians then and now should imitate? Do you see it? They, they taught what this book teaches. This book, this letter, is the summary of that teaching. The letter to the Hebrews is the Christian's guide to how the priests and the prophets and the kings pointed to Jesus in the yesterday of the Old Testament. The, the letter to the Hebrews is also the Christian's guide to today, constantly reminding us not only of how people used to see Christ and not only even what Christ has now finished doing for us. But the letter to the Hebrews is also focused with what Christ, it focuses on what Christ is doing now, today, as he rules over us and intercedes for us. It's a book that takes us to Jesus now, which is why verse 9 tells us not to go back where we began. Already by the time that this book was written, in fact, from the moment that Jesus died and rose again, all those signs and types of the old covenant, all those foods and sacrifices were no longer benefiting those still devoted to them. For, for a Christian to look, at, to look at shadows and mirrors, when we have the son of righteousness himself, is to be led away, as verse 9 says, by diverse and strange teachings. Our altar is the cross. We are satisfied with nothing less than Christ. As verse 10 says, those who are willing to be nourished by something less than Christ have no right to feed on him. As verses 11 to 13 say, we're no longer on the inside of the group content with a revelation, we're, we're no longer on the inside of that group that's content with a revelation without Christ. No, we, we'd rather be outside that group, outside the camp with Jesus, than inside any camp without Jesus. To be led back to where believers once were is to dishonor what Christ has now done. But it's also very important to remember that 
Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. They, in the yesterday, did not get a better Jesus. They got the same Jesus, but we see him more clearly. That's why we don't want to go back to yesterday. But is that all that we have? No, the book of Hebrews not only talks about yesterday and today, it not only says, don't go back there, be happy here. No, no, any Christian leader who speaks the whole of the word of God, the whole of the book of Hebrews doesn't stop there because Jesus is not only the same yesterday and today, he's also the same forever. The word of God, when it's understood rightly and taught rightly, not only focuses on the already, it also says something about the not yet. A, a good leader stands up and, and says to the gathered people of God, in the words of verse 14, here we have no lasting city. We seek a city that is to come. I'm a historian, but I'm not content with just history. We are in this world to be salt and light, to defend what is right, to proclaim salvation for all who repent. But we are not content with here and now. We are Christians. And so we long to be with Christ. We want Jesus for all time. We want a Jesus who is gloriously the same yesterday and today and forever. That's the gospel that we teach in our Bible studies, in our preaching, and we echo it all in our prayers. Let us pray now. Our Father in heaven, thank you for giving us your word, a writing that is holy and set apart from all other writings. We praise you for this library of books that bears your signature on every line. As we have seen again today, it is there that we find our true story. It is in your book that we meet you, our creator, you, the architect and builder of all things. And hard as it is to read, it is in these holy pages that you shed light on the darkness that has overcome every human heart, including our hearts. How grateful we are then, Father, that from the record of Genesis to the prophecy of Malachi, from the gospel of Matthew to the revelation of John, we find in this book first a plan and then a history and then a promise of our salvation. In fact, we find the Savior himself. We meet Abraham and Aaron, Samuel and Jehoshaphat, Solomon and Jeremiah, and each of these is a gift to us, presented in your word, but always pointed to something later and better. You gave patriarchs, and yet when we study their history, we do not find in them the spouse for which we yearn. You presented the priests, but they could never offer the, pro the, the, the presence that we long for or the one sacrifice that we need. You provided judges, but they proved to be unjust kings who are only a shadow of the ruler who must subdue us and rule over us and protect us from all his and our enemies. Next came the gift of wise men, the greatest of whom fell into foolishness, against which he warned. Last of all came the prophets, but they could not persuade your people to turn from their sins. All of this you gave by inspiration to warn us in this life and to direct us to faith. And yet, Father, what makes us love this book best of all is that it's here you show us Jesus, the effective prophet who called us to repentance, the teacher who astonishes us with his insight, the bringer of the kingdom and the judge of all the world. It's here that we learn of a God coming among us 
a high priest offering himself for us. And so we praise you for the New Testament and the Old. We also ask that you would teach us by your Holy Spirit to ever praise you for your Son, the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever until the day that we will feast with him and with every saved sinner at the wedding feast of the Lamb. Gracious God, we come to you today to give you our praises, but we also come to give you our petitions, especially for the work of the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship in the Philippines. We pray first and most practically that this fellowship would continue to center all of its work and to find its guidance in your holy word, the Bible. We pray that all of us would learn from many books, that this fellowship would create helpful new curricula, but help us never to forget that there's only one book that you have breathed out, one book to rule your church and to guide us home. We come as well to thank you that brotherly love can continue among believers even in these strange days, along with love for others who need food and friendship. We pray for the seekers and the wanderers in touch with this fellowship, people who above all need Christ himself. We thank you too, Father, for the technology that's permitted ministry in the midst of a pandemic. We thank you for small groups and for Bible studies, discipleship and mentoring, even the big gatherings that have connected online. But help us never to forget the need that many still have for hospitality. Help us to remember the persecuted church, more visible to its oppressors in the advancement of technology. Help those who are separated from those whom they love. Help those who have become poor and those who have become rich during these days. And help us all to be content and confident in you, to be satisfied with who you are and what you do. We remember the missioners, leaders, disciples. We give thanks for the pastors in our churches, and we also give thanks for those who are in the IVCF leadership that teach people the word of God. We pray for Bible study leaders. Grant more leaders, we pray. More who know that you are faithful, who see you as their helper. Grant us leaders whose way of life is worthy of consideration and whose strong faith is worthy of imitation. As you surround your throne with adoring saints and angels, so accompany your word with many admiring witnesses in this fellowship. Give us people who marvel at your speech, your justice, your gospel, people who are humbled before you, O Lord. Give us people who reverence the Old Testament, who see the heavenliness of the New Testament, who feel the power of scriptural teaching, who dived the depths of biblical poetry and prose, who celebrate your plots to save your people. Give us people who will testify that this book is like no other book and our God like no other God. Give us Bible study leaders who are not led away by diverse and strange teaching, but who glorify you for every word in your word. We pray as well for the directors, the coordinators, the managers, the secretaries, and the staff of IVCF. We pray for their families. We pray for graduates and alumni, for trustees and supporters. So much goes on that only you see. Help us to do that work too with the power and the help of your mighty spirit. Help these brothers and sisters, too, in this fellowship to find nourishment and confidence and contentment in you alone. Indeed, O Father, help all in this fellowship to find reason in the holy pages of Scripture to sing your praises, 
open wide the gates of the Bible so that truth will pour out of its pages like a mighty army and overwhelm our doubts. And may the King of glory conquer our hearts and subdue the lives of the people in the Philippines and around the world. Will you do this, Father? We know that you will, because we ask this in the name of Jesus, the one who is with us and for us, not only yesterday, but also today and every day and forever. Amen.